What's up guys, Chris Doyle here. Thanks for tuning back into Johnny Jigs TV. Hopefully you took the time to watch our last video, slow pitch jigging bluefin tuna on the Polaris Supreme out of San Diego, California. We did end up fishing in Mexican waters. Well, we heard a lot of questions, uh, comments, calls to the shop and emails and we wanted to take the time in this video to dig deeper into the exact rods, reels, line, connections, terminal tackle, hooks, jigs, etc. We want to get a little bit more technical and give you guys the information that we discovered while jigging out in the Pacific for big bluefin tuna. So stay tuned, it's going to be informative. We're just a few guys that decided to pursue our passion as we hit destination fishing spots in our local waters out of Pompano Beach, Florida. We want to fill you in on what we have learned along the way. What's up guys, Johnny Stedham here, and I'm about to go over rods with you guys, what we were using on our trip to San Diego and why we picked these rods. So Michael Gruber asks, first time watching, new subscriber, can you tell me about the rod and reel setup you used? Um, he also said, love the acid wrap rod, need, one, need a setup like that. So Michael, thank you for subscribing first off and thank you for the question. Um, so the acid wrap rod was my pro jigger. So it's a Johnny Jigs pro jigger. I brought power two, power three, power four, and I could tell you that my power four sat in the rod holder um, for the entirety of the trip. Um, I used my power three when it came to tunas. And if you guys stay tuned, we're going into the rockfish in our next video um, where I actually broke out the power two. But the power three was perfect. It had the perfect action that I needed um, for the daytime jigging. Um, I was using lighter line at one point um, and then I went a little bit heavier. Um, at nighttime, things changed a little bit. Um, you could have just dropped down anything and it was really a matter of bringing in the fish quickly. There wasn't much action needed on the jig other than dropping it down to them. So you definitely would have got away with the Twisted Sister, which is a stouter rod. It has a beefier butt section. It's actually um, got a longer EVA grip on it so you could set it on the rail um, and, and use it that way. And then another rod that was really shining was the Temple Reef Grand Crew. It's the orange rod that you'll see in this video video uh, right here. It's a power three and you will see um, Niel who is the son of, of our friend Corey who is our California ambassador who invited us to California kind of showed us the ropes helped us get on the Polaris Supreme but Niel um, just pulls up uh, an 80 pound tune I believe it was one pound shy of 80 pounds um, with the Temple Reef Grand Crew um, what I can tell you is that the downside of it is you cannot put this rod on the rail because it doesn't have a long EVA cushion you could see that Corey is helping his son Niel to keep him off of the rail with that rod but I could tell you that the the stout a butt section of that rod handled this fish very well and it was a beautiful fish by Niall and Niall also um, contributed to some of the music in our previous video and thank you for that Niall. Um, and last but not least, um, Will was definitely uh, chiming in and, and loving on the um, Elementus by Ocean's Legacy and that's another great option for you. Um, and once again, you know, we did catch fish up to uh, 50 pounds, you know, and these are schoolies. I know that as we get later in the season, a lot of you told me that the fish will get bigger. So, um, you know, our thoughts are definitely gearing towards like, what if there it was a slow pitch jigging um, rod that can be used to put on the rail, a rail rod essentially, that is, is for uh, working a jig and doing the action of a jig that we like to, to do. So, um, and just a little, um, just a little thought for you guys, if you're wondering why are we using slow pitch jigging rods? Well, it's kind of like putting cork inside of your baseball bat. The jig moves further and you can, you get a lot of control and a lot of action with that parabolic tip. And we use them simply because it works a jig better than using per se a broomstick. Oh, we're tight baby. Woo. Yeah. Bye. Coming down, coming down, coming down. Coming down, guys. So let's talk about the reels that we considered for this trip and ended up bringing. Now, a little bit of background is, 
All we do is slow pitch jig out here in Florida and anywhere else that we go to. So the reels that, that we use actively are narrow spooled reels, which give us a full grip uh, around both the rod and the reel itself. So we have not only level winding capabilities as we're retrieving line, which we do often, but we also have control and comfort in our grip around that reel. So when considering larger class fish like bluefin tuna that we were hoping to find in the Pacific, we definitely needed and wanted to have that, that type of body to the reel, but it needed to be strong enough, have enough drag and have enough line capacity to handle larger grade tuna. So what we did was we brought a few of our accurate reels, accurate Valiant 500 narrow, single speeds and there was a big cause for consideration to make sure we had some two speed reels as well so we had the accurate valiant 600 double n two speed reels believe it or not both of these reels proved to be very effective on the tuna that we were catching the reel that we were really excited to bring and put into use were the maxell rage slow pitch jigging reels will johnny and myself each brought a Maxell Rage 90, and we were excited to put most of the time on the rail using these reels. They're narrow bodied spools, they hold a ton of line, so as we bumped our braid up, which we're gonna get into line braiding connections in just a second, we had enough line capacity to handle maybe some deep runs of some larger grade tuna. Lucky for us, all of our gear worked phenomenally, we were also faced against mostly 40 to 50 pound tuna. On day two, when we were hunting for larger grade tuna, an 88 pounder won the pool, but there was nothing in the triple digits. So we still wonder how the reels and the rods that we're talking about will match up against 100 pound plus tuna. And an interesting fact that Johnny had mentioned about the tuna that we were getting into and these boats seeing larger tuna just a little bit later as the spring progresses is that the two subsequent trips on the Polaris Supreme to ours landed both 120 and 140 pound fish. So some people have been messing us saying you guys just missed it. But for our first stab at bluefin tuna jigging out in the Pacific, we think we nailed it. We caught our limits of bluefin tuna. All of our gear held up uh, amazingly. And I was really most excited to, to watch myself hook and land a bluefin tuna in the 40 to 50 pound range quickly on an accurate Valiant 500N single speed. I really stand behind the performance uh, of the accurate Valiant 500N. I think a single speed is adequate enough to handle these size fish. And I do believe that you can go into a larger grade fish even with the single speed accurate Valiant 500 narrow. I did it, it worked, I felt comfortable doing it and that really excited me. The reel that I really enjoyed the most up against these fish that I know will handle larger grade tuna were those Maxell Rage 90 Narrows. They had plenty of line capacity for a larger diameter line and their drag was more than sufficient to handle the fish that we were up against and I was very confident that the drag system would handle larger grade fish as well. Um, personally, I had my strike position set at about 20 pounds, which allowed my max drag to be a touch over 30 pounds. I rarely, if not never, put my drag above the strike position in the reel. There was actually many instances when we were fishing at night that when I closed my lever drag, I closed it just before strike. So if a fish really started peeling on me, my next move was to bump it into the 20 pounds at strike and then go beyond it if I had to. But I really never felt the need to, to put more drag on these fish. Uh, if you watched our last video, we got to interview and talk with Captain Allier up in the wheelhouse and he, he used the term stupid uh, when he was describing bluefin tuna at night. For lack of a better word, they, they, they were, their inhibitions were down. Uh, it was a matter of just dropping the jig in the water and waiting for it to stop. That was the, the fish picking, picking up the jig. Uh, at that point, close the lever and crank to get tight with the fish. And that, that was pretty much uh, the, the whole 
game plan. That was pretty much the whole game plan behind the strike. And then we were just reeling these fish to the surface slow and steady. Um, and if, if I could make just one quick point on technique, slow pitch jigging, this is, this is what we do here in Florida and it was no different um, out into the Pacific. But once we were tight with the fish, we moved these rods underneath our, our arm and fought the fish with the rod having a downward position rarely ever pumping or cranking on on a fish unless that fish was scoped out we would always follow the angle of the line with our tip that got every single one of these fish up relatively quickly with ease gaffable and in the ice box and now in our freezers back home here in florida all right guys so i want to talk to you a little bit about slow pitch jigging technique and what we do whenever we're targeting tunas um, i did find that i wasn't doing much different from what we do with the blackfin tunas here or i've done with yellowfin tunas in the past um, so it seems like the tunas really will key into um, um, a faster movement. A lot of times I'll do um, a long fall, but during the day was the most noticeable um, difference that we realized slow pitch jigging was working and more effective during the day um, than uh, just dropping it down and reeling it up. So really, if you see, if you could see in this video here, I'm putting the rod across my forearm there and I'll do some fast twitches, but then I'm going up and I'm allowing the jig to fall down. So when it comes to jigs, a slow pitch jig is going to be asymmetrical. So it's different on both sides. So it's designed actually to fall in a pattern that looks like a wounded bait fish um, to where a high speed jig, so what you guys call is you drop it down to the bottom and you reel it up fast. Um, that's a high, what a high speed jig would work for. Generally are symmetrical, they're the same on both sides. They're made to be um, used vertically and essentially you're uh, imitating a fleeing bait fish. So we've got wounded bait fish and we've got fleeing bait fish. So when it comes to the technique, you know, the slow pitch rods will have a slow unload. It unloads very slowly looking like the, the fish is sort of struggling. Uh, the bait fish is struggling as it's going up and then you allow the jig to fall. When you do that, you need to leave slack in your line. Let the jig do what it's designed to do and then it will create a strike. So I could show you a couple clips during the day where I actually on the fall the tunas were hitting so Chris and I were hooking up consistently during the day using a traditional slow pitch jigging technique um, there's more on technique if you go into uh, our YouTube channel videos you'll see technique done by um, our friend and a very famous guy for slow pitch jigging uh, Mr. Benny Ortiz um, he does a great explanation of the technique that we're doing um, granted we're doing it um, for in shallower waters in that video you kind of take that and apply it to uh, your fishery as well and it will work so just to go over a few jigs that were hot for us on this trip our tuna teaser in pink and the guava torpedo in 300 that was the size that we needed to stay vertical as well as our buddy from west coast jiggers james his jigs did very well on this trip. You could see our friend Niel holding up this uh, amazing 80 pound tuna, just shy of 80 pounds, 79 pounds. That was caught on James Jigs from West Coast Jiggers. I'll put a link down below to his Instagram. And also at Fisherman's Landing Tackle in San Diego, you guys can walk right in there right now and pick up any of the jigs that I've listed as well as several other ones that will definitely be effective for you uh, when it comes to catching bluefin tuna out of San Diego. So what we're used to here in South Florida targeting bottom species with our braid is getting away with really, really thin diameter braid and also making sure we have an adequate break strength. Going against these fish, we know we needed to improve the, the break strength of the line. And the conversations that we had with people ranged generally from maybe 65 pound test braid at the absolute minimum all the way up in, into, the, into the hundreds, well into the hundreds of pounds of break strength. We knew we didn't want to go that big, so our thinking was let's spool our reels with what we really want to use, which is something like a 40 pound test braid in an eight strand makeup 
that has a diameter or right around what you would call PE3 to PE3.5, which is uh, about 0.35 millimeters in diameter. Don't want to get too technical. I want to keep this simple uh, because there's PE scale ratings, which identify diameters of braid. There's the common millimeter, which is printed on, on all of our braids. Uh, and then there's the, the, the brake strength as well. But we wanted to choose the line that we'd like to do it with. And that, that was right in the 40 pound brake strength range. So we chose Daiwa J-Braid eight strand multicolor and we were all spooled with that. Also to play it on the safe side and our thinking safe side was going with 65. We didn't go any bigger than 65 pound test braid. We need that diameter because we knew that the Pacific is notorious for heavy seas and wind. And we knew that the challenges we face here in Florida were gonna be very similar out there and we were prepared for even worse, which means we need a thin diameter on our braid to, to hold vertical and be able to get nice pitches on the jig. So we chose 65 pound test um, in Berkeley X9, which kind of has a notoriously thinner diameter than any other lines that you put it up against. Um, Will and John also used some heavier Daiwa J-Braid multicolor in the 50 and 65 pound test range as well. But we were right there. We were in between 40 pound uh, test Daiwa J-Braid and 65 pound test Daiwa J-Braid and Berkeley X9. That's what we spooled all of our reels. So we've always we've always favored multicolor lines. It's not absolutely mandatory, and you need a little bit of an ana analytical mind. But the multicolored or metered lines allow you to better gauge what depth your jig is at. What you're doing is you're counting colors. Whether you're counting colors when you first drop your jig in the water, how many are going out, or whether once your jig hits the bottom you identify what color is showing on your spool, and when you begin to retrieve, you know how far off the bottom, in a general sense, you are. So Daiwa J-Braid offers a multicolor braid that has 10 meters per color in a five color rotation. What that really means is every color is 32 feet. When I use this line, I try to keep it a little simpler and just calculate 30 feet per color uh, in my head, but man, Going out there and being on this boat when the captain's going over the loudspeaker, constantly giving us the information on where he's marking fish. 60 to 120 guys, 80 to 200 guys, school in 220 guys, school up high guys. And so he's giving us those, those depth readings. So when he says 60, I know I can throw my jig out and watch, watch two, maybe a little bit more than two colors go out and I'm getting into those fish already. You know, three colors, four colors, I'm in the middle of the school. So a metered line, when the captain's giving you information on where he's marking fish, can help you precisely get your jig in front of those fish with very little guessing involved, like a solid color braid will do. We matched our braid up with fluorocarbon leaders, uh, about eight to 10 feet, normal length, and we chose uh, both 80 pound and 100 pound fluorocarbon leaders to top shop on our braid. We hear that these grade tuna are notorious for being able to cut your fluorocarbon leader off. Um, in many cases, they'll actually inhale the jig completely, allowing the fluorocarbon to then run through their teeth where they're able to chomp it off just like any other scissor fish that uh, we get down here in Florida. So for that reason, there's a good cause to use a heavier fluorocarbon leader. 80 pounds is probably just about as light as you want to go. I did experience getting cut off by one of these tuna, um, which likely inhaled the jig and just sawed my fluorocarbon leader off and I, and I lost the fish. I did, after that experience, I did fish almost exclusively 100 pound fluorocarbon leader after that and landed every fish that I got tight with. So 100 pound fluorocarbon was definitely a cause for success with these 40 to 50 pound tuna. We didn't get into larger grade tuna, but I'm sure as the tuna increase in size, so does their ability to cut your fluorocarbon leader off. And you'll hear guys going as high as 200 and even 300 pound fluorocarbon top shots. I don't see us getting there on our slow pitch setups, but maybe bumping up to 120 or 150 and seeing how that uh, performs against larger grade tuna. All right, so what did we learn out on our trip to San Diego? Like what did we bring home with us? And I guess what would we have done differently? Yeah, so some definite takeaways are rod length. 
you know, having some extra length on the rod, being on a head boat, we talk about that, like on the Yankee and the Patriot down here in Florida, having that extra length to get around the, the anchor on the bow, to get around other anglers, and to also have some range to be off the, the gunnel of the boat to keep your line away from the hull. You had one instance on the bow where there was some yeah me. julie yeah i needed to get over the anchor and granted i'm fishing a seven foot uh rod our, our johnny jigs pro jigger uh power three is seven foot long but the thing is the parabolic bend of the yeah. rod so when i'm bent over like this to be able to get over that anchor and around and the, cr um, the crates of chains that were on that's the right so check out julian yeah. here he is and he's you know he's essentially lifting my rod for me a bit so i'm not tapping my blank onto the anchor and then I get over to the other side and I'm good to go. So yeah. that's definitely a point. And then there were some ideas that we had um, about building a slow pitch rod for the boat. Right, for the rail, the, the grip. Yep. Right. So an extended EVA uh, grip I think was a good idea for the reason of um, being able to set it on the rail. On the rail and and fight the fish so so we caught fish that were in between you know 40 and 50 pounds but right. what happens whenever you get into that 200 larger yeah the grand crew uh, by temple reef handled those fish extremely well i was so happy using that rod but when they went on a run i'm just holding that little foregrip and just holding on for dear life rod but under my arm and with the jig star rod that i was using that we all used i had the foregrip and boom you can rest that right on the rail you can get torque and leverage kind of sitting down and bending that rod back up to help turn the fish and keep them coming so foregrip seemed to be pretty key on a boat like that next thing would be the inchy crew jig I wish I brought that with me. Yeah. And the reason why was when the boat was stopping, at that moment that the boat was still sliding, we didn't want to pitch our jigs because if you pitch your jig, then you're going to end up either under the boat, down the boat. You're not going to stay vertical until that boat really slows down and settles into its uh, um, natural right. drift speed. But you're, he's, he's stopping the boat and saying, go. Yeah. But we know with our jigs, if we go, we're going to end up right not where we want to be which is which is a it, it's a it's a peculiar situation yeah. because you want to get your jig down because the captain's saying go because you know you're over the fish right. so what these guys the locals were doing they were throwing out those cold snipers so as as either uh um johnny or julian were pitching those live sardines out those guys were were Right slipping their cold sniper jigs out yeah. and letting it float back with the the yeah. sardines but if you had an inchy coup jig what happens is you've got a wider profile jig that's actually designed to work in the current and look like a wounded bait fish yeah. fighting the current and that would have been highly effective i know for us mm -hmm. out there i agree good point so one last thing, um, yeah. we had uh, Jess Mortison asked, uh, he, well first he said, sick video, thank you bro, appreciate it. Um, how did Will do? And he must have been camera shy is what Jess said. So um, how did Will do? Yeah, well he's not camera shy for sure, but he, he fished his heart out. He was on the rail. He put about 10 fish on the deck, he you did. know, I, I'd say, but we had the chest cams on. We were wearing those stupid hat cams that get good footage. And, uh, and uh, you know, John and I were going to work with those cameras on and, and Will just wasn't in the frame quite a bit. But we did pick up some good shots, I think, here and there, so. Guys, check out some clips of Will uh, crushing fish for all you Will Crane fans out there. Over, under. So guys, thank you so much for all the new subscribers from San Diego. Um, thanks for checking out our videos. We're gonna continue to bring uh, content to you guys about jigging. Um, it's something that we're passionate about. It's something that we do day in and day out and we love it. And uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. Where can you follow us? Instagram, Facebook, and we have a lot of fun on TikTok too. Most importantly, jig, jig on. on.